Over the many years, we've seen The Simpsons evolve and grow through various stages of development. From the formative first season, to the Gene and Reese era, to David Merkin, Oakley and Weinstein, four years of Mike Scully, and finally the Al Jean solo tenure. Each showrunner had their own unique style and sensibility, making their mark and then handing it off to the next guy. Even through Al Jean's first three years, we've seen the show change and reinvent itself for a very new cultural environment. However, season 16 isn't the end of an era, isn't the handoff to something radically different. It's year 4 of 19 of the Al Jean era. I think what season 16 represents is a new maturation point of The Simpsons, the confirmation of a new phase in the series' life. The Simpsons' adolescence is officially over. Season 16 is the year The Simpsons reached adulthood. Man, I wish this was season 18. This analogy would be perfect. Anyway, perhaps it's appropriate that season 16 is the adulthood year in a symbolic sense, because substantially, season 16 is a fairly adult-oriented year. It's like that No Kids episode from last year was an omen. Now they're doing stories about menopause, prescription drugs, and buying an RV. Bart and Lisa have set aside their childish toys and instead get episodes about society expecting them to grow up quicker, saying goodbye to their childhoods, trying to fit into more adult settings, and flash forwarding into teens. We're starting to see a much more topical approach to The Simpsons again, setting up simple conflicts to explore an underlying topic in greater detail. For example, one of the major themes of season 16 is religion and Christianity in particular. What can be older and more mature than doing plots about religion? Homer and Ned make a Bible-themed halftime show in one episode. In another, Homer sees a Christian-themed movie, warns everyone of the rapture, and spends Act 3 in heaven. And in the season finale, Bart and Homer both want to convert to Catholicism, leading to a fight over these beliefs. Then there are the episodes where religion is touched upon in the story, like Home Away from Homer, Goo Goo Guy Pan, and There's Something About Marrying. I think with the release of The Passion of the Christ and the hype around it at that time, it makes some sense that the writers would be more apt to write Christianity into more of the backdrop of Springfield. In the last retrospective, I had remarked upon the post-9-11 environment, with The Simpsons doing an episode like Bart Mangled Banner. There is nothing as explicitly critical of the US government in season 16, but there is a strong uptick in quote-unquote issues episodes. Why are drug prices so high in America? Should we legalize gay marriage? What about the privatization of the prison system? What is this global warming that everyone is talking about? Are corporations contributing to childhood obesity? Naturally, the show did plenty of strictly character-driven adventures, but this was a season that liked tackling those big issues head on. I think it's telling that instead of spending Act 3 resolving Bart's personal weight problems, he goes back to school to smash those vending machines. The issue trumps the character arc. In a B-plot in another episode, Lisa had her own body image problem to deal with and doesn't find an easy answer. Actually, now that I mention it, season 16 has a bunch of food plots in it. This was a year very concerned about the Simpsons diet. Gotta get that fiber, you know? Even Snowball 2 got a B-plot where she gets overfed. Personally, I blame Marge's award-winning dessert dogs. I like how the family eats so much processed garbage that the moment Lisa gets them to eat veggies, they puke all over the place. Wait a minute, is that the rumpus room? Wait a minute, is this the rumpus room too? Season 16 is officially a top-tier season. I feel like with all these cabinets and the angle used, it was easy to confuse this with Homer and Marge's bedroom. This must have been part of Season 16's many remodeling projects. After all, this was a year where they got a brand new kitchen, turned their garage into a wedding chapel, brought in a contractor to fix their roof, and turned Moe's into a British pub. Why not rearrange the rumpus room while you're at it? Season 16 does feel kind of modern in the sense that there is an underlying hustle culture to it, where characters are starting side businesses or finding creative ways to pay their bills. Flanders rents a room to these college students, Homer and Marge turn their house into a youth hostel. I'd imagine Homer would have charged these RV guys if he could have. In addition, Bart starts a t-shirt business, Marge works with Mo to protect their investment, Homer does gay weddings and teaches athletes how to dance. 
I'm surprised Homer didn't get that prison guard job with all the side hustles going on. Wait, that was last year. In terms of money issues, it's hard to tell if everyone is just super rich now or is barely scraping by. Homer and Marge finally paid off the mortgage, which is why they're able to invest in Moe's. They can clearly afford a new RV and that expensive new kitchen. Selma's dropping 10k for Ling like it's no problem. It's just Bart's exercise camp and the prescription drugs that create a budget squeeze. Oh, speaking of which, have you ever noticed how much Season 16 loves its medicine and life insurance? Geez, this series really has become an adult. Even Bart can't get away from the insurance jokes. I can't remember if everyone in the mid-2000s were all coked up on Viagra and Zoloft or whatever, or if this is just what happens when so many characters are having health issues. This is a strange year of The Simpsons to look back on because it is such a mix of hilariously dated concepts and stuff still relevant today. I mean, they did an episode that guest starred both Tom Brady and LeBron James that aired 18 years ago, and both of them are still playing today. Even today, in 2030, Tom Brady is out there plugging away on one leg for the Washington Red Wolves. But then you watch an episode like Pranks to Rap, and see Bart get on that stage, and it's like, oh no. Although honestly, this was a how do you do fellow kids, even back in 2005. Other topical episodes, like the gay marriage one, seem progressive in a mid-2000s way, and then they make a satirical mess of things in Act 3. You watch so many of these and are like, hey, nothing has changed in the past 18 years. That's good satire. It's just, some of the writing approaches they probably would have done differently today. Structurally, we're not seeing plots swerve all over the place that much. We'll get a few opening set pieces, like the school's medieval fair, the glacier field trip, the Shelbyville musical, maybe an artsy movie, but all of these are fairly typical Simpsons jumping off points. They tend to arrive at what the episode's gonna be about fairly quickly. The only story that goes off the rails, focus-wise, is Fat Man and Little Boy, which transforms into a Homer Lisa story with a nuclear reactor. In terms of the joke writing, we've most certainly reached the point in our retrospective's journey where very little is changing stylistically. From seasons 14 to 15 to 16, we've seen them crystallize into a warmer and less edgy comedic style. It's not especially subversive in terms of screwing the audience, Probably the best example is this one, where instead of contrasting with what movie Patty would see, she's literally making out with a woman. Also, love this extended joke where Homer flops around forever and ever, and suddenly his tongue kills everyone. Good stuff. Season 16 is a smidge more surreal than the previous couple. They'll do a futuristic episode like Future Drama that explicitly thanks scientists for inventing magic. Or something like Thank God It's Doomsday, where most of Act 3 is an extended fantasy sequence. Or is it? Instead of doing cutaways, they much prefer to do fantasies, flashbacks, and thought bubbles. I forgot about how prevalent the thought bubble jokes were in Season 16. They were all over this thing. There is this odd trend with Homer in particular, where he seems to want to be best friends or lovers with himself. Even outside of fantasies, Homer is all about that self-love. Insert reference here about Homer masturbating 8 billion times. This is quietly one of the more self-aware and meta seasons of The Simpsons. They're getting more in your face about the out-of-universe references, like having Homer literally draw himself for Lisa. They'll have David Silverman teach us how to draw Bart as a closer. When doing a freeze frame joke, they'll pause and Homer will say, have you read them all? Comic book guy will reveal his real name is Jeff Albertson. They'll recreate the entire opening sequence with overweight Bart. Even in a down-to-earth affair, like Don't Fear the Roofer, they'll self-consciously joke around about the implausible black holes to explain things. Of course, that episode secretly turned into an extended parody of A Beautiful Mind, so they had to get the plot to work somehow. This one is easily the most stylistic and thematic of season 16's parodies and homages. They were instead more apt to simply copy-paste a piece of media into The Simpsons' world. American Idol becomes Krusty's Little Star Maker contest. Instead of watching Left Behind, Homer watches Left Below. Ned Flanders makes gory Bible pics like Passion of the Christ. They did a VeggieTales version as well. 
I do notice some doubling up of some of their TV and references in season 16. They go for two different E.T. homages, two jokes where there's a video inside of a video. They even do an entire Hooters restaurant parody after showing a Hooters shirt in another episode. Someday, I hope to see the documentary about the great Hooters vs. Knockers chicken wing war in Springfield. Season 16's awkward wordplay humor continues to be top notch, although nothing was going to top last year's Saskata Gap and Papaskatag. But just given all the t shirt gags this year, it's going to be a contender. In particular, I love the Ray Magini anagram, a hen without cock, Albert Brooks's rants about tough love, and Bart reading this as kata hay cheese. Thanks, The Simpsons, you've damaged my brain's interpretation of this word. The Al Jean era has done so many awkward wordplay jokes that they've started turning them into jewelry. Speaking of the man himself, the Al Jean music montage era has continued its reign of terror. We might be past the peak of the mountain, as there didn't seem to be quite as many this go-round. The episodes about the Super Bowl halftime show, Lisa's restraining order, and the Doomsday Prediction all had double music montages, but otherwise they were used more sparingly. My favorite is probably Ned's magnificent mustache montage, the most memorable moment of his move. The list of guest stars in season 16 is kind of odd in how backloaded they are. Early on, we get Kim Cattrall and Eric Idle playing new characters mixing it up in Springfield. But then in the second half, it's like every other episode. Lucy Liu in China, Amy Poehler's character dating Bart, best friend Ray Romano, health coach Albert Brooks, amazing singer Fantasia Barino, and a Catholic priest with a very particular set of skills. Season 16 isn't an especially Hollywood year of The Simpsons, so we don't get as many celebrities popping into Springfield as themselves. It's really just the group of sports stars in the Super Bowl episode, James Caan partying in the treehouse, 50 Cent and Pranks to Rap, Frank Gehry designing their prison, Thomas Pinchon's second cameo, and then Stephen Hawking returns to explain the roofer. I do definitely feel the loss of Phil Hartman in season 16, with them bringing in Gary Busey and Robert Wagner for educational videos. Both guests are very memorable and do a great job, but these feel like such Troy McClure roles. As for the rest of the Simpsons characters, well for them, we gotta go to everyone's favorite specialized niche YouTube segment. It's time for the Secondary Character Stockwatch. Everyone, he finally did it. He finally reached the top of Secondary Character Mountain. Forget about the rise of Moe, forget about Skinner last year, Season 16 belongs to Chief Wiggum. This guy has always been everywhere, showing up in like 80-90% to 90 of Simpsons episodes in some manner. What puts Chief Wiggum over the top here is their first attempt at a spotlight episode. It's not a full one, but it's something that gives this guy some extra depth. Add in his major role in the Treehouse of Horror, and his countless, countless minor jokes, and you gotta hand it to him. Here Clancy, enjoy your award. I look forward to your third place finish next year. There's a strong case for Ned Flanders too, who got his own spotlight episode, a B-plot, and a trial segment. He doesn't show up as often as Wiggum, but the higher emphasis on religion plots made Flanders extremely relevant. Flanders is the quality over quantity winner of season 16. Patty and Selma did decently well for themselves, each getting a spotlight, Nelson had a pretty strong year too, mostly thanks to sleeping with the enemy. I would argue that Milhouse did even better than Nelson, getting lots of face time with Bart and Lisa. Season 16 is like the horny Milhouse season, disturbingly enough, with the play dude subplot, them looking at internet porn, and him chasing after Lisa. I don't know which is odder, horny Milhouse or drug addicted Ralph. Wasn't expecting three Ralph drug jokes going into this. Moe took a slight step back, getting a spotlight with Marge, but was otherwise becoming a Lenny or Carl-esque member of the crowd. Krusty remained mostly relevant in season 16, showing up for the American Idol episode and a couple minor TV appearances. It's not especially Mr. Burns heavy season either, not many nuclear power plant storylines for him to rule with an iron fist. The biggest loser of season 16 is, by far, Principal Skinner. 
Poor Seymour, after breaking up with Edna, everything is falling apart for him. Season 16 is not especially school focused, where he can push the plot forward, so he's left with humiliating jokes with Edna or the kids dunking on him. We might be in dark Skinner times for a while in these retrospectives. As for the biggest winner, I'm going to circle back around to season 14 and give this one to Cletus and Brandine again. Just Brandine being the finalist in the cooking contest is a new peak of relevancy for the character. But these two continued popping up more regularly. We are firmly in the Spuckler era of the show now. Also the Crazy Cat Lady era. There's a lot of her too. As for the Simpson family itself, I think we need to separate this into the adults versus the kids because season 16 wasn't a year about parenting. We are definitely in peak marriage crisis era of the show. When people complain about the constant Homer and Marge drama in later day Simpsons, season 16 is a key example. They're fighting over a mobile home, over Moe's bars, over a mysterious roofer, over Catholicism, and are officially separated in a flash forward. The China trip is one of the rare moments these two actively seem to work together. This is a surprisingly aggressive and impulsive year for Homer, characterization-wise, where he'll make major purchases or start side hustles without letting Marge know. He's a bit angrier than season 15, constantly strangling Bart and fighting it out with Lisa. Boy, does he fight it out with Lisa. I can see why Marge gets so exhausted with him, because this is a Homer with somehow less impulse control than usual. Insert reference here about Homer masturbating 8 billion times. Honestly, it was a challenging year for Marge as a whole. In addition to the Homer stuff, she was also fighting it out in the cooking competition, feeling underappreciated by her children, and feeling envious of her high school friend's success. Then, in the gay marriage episode, struggling when the issue comes close to home. I kind of love Marge's feisty characterization in season 16 and how openly she grapples with some of those issues. She can be petty and small and hypocritical, but it's something she's working through. I think Bart bounced back a little after a very humiliating season 15. But just a little. They still like to kick Bart around and humble him. His addiction to junk food did not go well. At the same time, Bart outings did a better job showing off his agency, shaping the narrative how he sees fit. The Bart Catholicism story lets him figure out things on his own, for example. We get a nice balance of pathetic Bart, mean prankster Bart, scheming Bart, and heartwarming Bart. Just no more rapping, please. As for Lisa, well, I kind of hate season 16 Lisa. Just having this episode in it immediately downgrades her yearly performance. But she's not used in an interesting way as a whole. Lisa mostly exists to be a morality pet or plot device for some stories, and to constantly bring up the underlying social and ethical issues in others. Now, this has always been a decent chunk of her characterization, let's be real here, but they've stopped balancing it with any sense of childlike joy or fun. Other than maybe the singing episode, Lisa's all business this year, and it's boring. When those internet people complain about how much they hate Lisa, this is the flanderized version they should be pointing to. Season 16 still is a fun season as a whole, which is why Lisa's characterization is somewhat disappointing. Just because season 16 represents reaching adulthood for The Simpsons doesn't mean the show is suddenly not going to have fun anymore or have good episodes in it. You're not going to get a zombie Simpsons argument out of me. At the same time, season 16 has always felt like the end of an era for the show. I feel similar about season 16 as many Latin American fans do about 15, which was their last with the original voice actors. We as a fandom have built an entire Katahe industry around discussing the first eight seasons, dubbing them classic Simpsons. But there's something to be said for the next set of eight, these chaotic teen years of the show. How Mike Scully brought in his unique style for four years, and then Al Jean had to guide the show through a rapidly changing cultural and political environment in America. Say what you want about the end result, but even their biggest critics would concede that the show continued to evolve. At this point, it does feel like The Simpsons has reached its final form. It's found its new voice, its distinct style and sensibility that will carry on through the next years. 
It's gonna try some experiments and tinker with the formula in season 17, but I'm probably gonna call that a refinement year, not a revolution year. I'm trying really, really hard to not say that The Simpsons became a boring adult in season 16, because I don't find it boring. Maybe stable is a better way to describe it. Season 16 is the end of an era, because it's not the end of an era. As always, let me know in the comments what you think of season 16 and its overall vibe. How much do you think the show has changed between 15 and 16? Do you think there even is a second era of The Simpsons? Food for thought. These retrospectives are all about looking at the changing styles and vibes, but maybe this video series should take a different approach to these later years. We'll see how I feel after I watch season 17. But I shouldn't get ahead of myself. I'll be back next time to rank the top 10 episodes from season 16. I still have no idea what's going to land at number 1, so let's find out together. As always, thanks for watching.